Hi everyone. Welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to take a look into the Mafia's top assassins. First is the infamous Mad Dog College. Vincent Mad Dog Cole, a notorious figure from Ireland, gained infamy during the Prohibition era. Possessing both striking looks and intelligence, he was not only a ruthless assassin but also suspected of being psychopathic. Throughout his brief existence, he established a dark legacy consisting of numerous gangland slayings, abductions, and even the horrifying murder of an innocent five-year-old child. This is the captivating tale of his life. Cole's merciless nature quickly established him as a valued enforcer in Schultz's ranks. As Schultz's criminal empire gained strength during the 1920s, Cole was recruited as an assassin. At the tender age of 19, Cole faced charges for the brutal slayings of Anthony Borello, a speakeasy owner, and Mary Smith, a dance hall hostess. It was rumored that Cole executed Borello due to his refusal to distribute Schultz's illicit alcohol. However, these charges mysteriously vanished, leading many to suspect Schultz's influence had played a role in their dismissal. Despite this, Schultz grew increasingly displeased with Cole's actions. In 1929, acting against Schultz's wishes, Cole orchestrated a daring heist at a Bronx dairy, making off with a staggering $17,000. Disguised as armed guards, Cole and his gang infiltrated the cashier's room to execute their plan. Schultz confronted Cole following the robbery, expecting remorse, but instead, Cole audaciously demanded equal partnership, an offer Schultz declined. By January 1930, Cole had assembled his own gang, embarking on a fierce conflict against Schultz. The early casualty of this vendetta was Peter Cole, Vincent's elder brother, who met his demise on a Harlem street on May 30, 1931. Consumed by grief and a thirst for revenge, Cole spiraled into a frenzied rampage. In the following weeks, he ruthlessly gunned down four of Schultz's men. The exact death toll from the ensuing bloodshed remains elusive, as the violent Castellameris War raged concurrently in New York, leaving the authorities bewildered as they attempted to disentangle the victims and assign them to their respective conflicts. On June 2nd, Cole and his gang brazenly invaded one of Schultz's garages, wreaking havoc by obliterating 120 vending machines and 10 trucks. As the war persisted, Cole and his crew mercilessly eliminated approximately 20 of Schultz's men. To sustain his burgeoning gang's operations, Cole resorted to kidnapping rival mobsters and holding them for ransom. Aware that these victims would avoid involving the police to avoid revealing their illegal income, Cole exploited their predicament. One prominent target was George Big Frenchy Demange, a renowned gambler closely associated with Oni Madden, the Hell's Kitchen Irish mob boss. According to reports, Cole lured Demange into a meeting, only to seize him at gunpoint. Demange regained his freedom 18 harrowing hours later after a substantial ransom payment was delivered to college. On the fateful day of July 28, 1931, Cole found himself allegedly involved in a kidnapping endeavor that tragically resulted in the fatal shooting of an innocent child. His intended target was Joseph Rao, a bootlegger affiliated with Schultz, who happened to be relaxing in front of a social club. Unbeknownst to Cole and his cohorts, several children were innocently playing nearby, outside an apartment building. Abruptly, a large touring car screeched to a halt at the curb, and a group of armed men brandishing shotguns and submachine guns took aim at Rao, unleashing a barrage of gunfire. Rao instinctively threw himself to the safety of the sidewalk, but the hail of bullets wounded four young children caught in the line of fire. Tragically, one of these innocent victims, five-year-old Michael Vengali, succumbed to his injuries at Beth David Hospital. The senseless loss of life prompted New York City Mayor Jimmy Walker to dub Cole a mad dog, encapsulating the public sentiment towards his heinous actions. Not long after his acquittal, Cole embarked on a new chapter of his life by entering into matrimony with Lottie Kreisberger, a prominent fashion designer residing in New York. Their union served as a testament to Cole's ability to forge personal connections amidst the tumultuous backdrop of his criminal endeavors. In the midst of the turbulent events surrounding Cole's acquittal for the Bengali case, an intriguing development unfolded in September 1931. Salvatore Maranzano, who had recently proclaimed himself the boss of bosses, hired Cole for a sinister task, to eliminate Charles Lucky Luciano, the newly appointed acting boss of the eponymous Mafia family. However, a timely tip-off from Tommy Lucchese alerted Luciano to the impending danger. Months earlier, Luciano had brought the Castellameris War to a close by ordering the assassination of his own boss, Joseph Masseria, effectively propelling Maranzano into a position of immense power within the five families. However, Maranzano soon perceived Luciano as a formidable threat to his reign. On September 10, Maranzano summoned Luciano, 
Vito Genovese, and Frank Costello to his office located at 230 Park Avenue in Manhattan. Sensing that Maranzano intended to orchestrate their murders, Luciano swiftly devised a plan of his own. Enlisting the assistance of four Jewish hitmen, whose identities were unknown to Maranzano and his enforcers, Luciano ensured that his allies Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel played crucial roles in securing their services. Posing as government agents, two of the hired gangsters skillfully disarmed Maranzano's bodyguards, while the remaining two, guided by Lucchese, who accompanied them to identify Maranzano, viciously attacked the Sicilian boss. Multiple stab wounds were inflicted before delivering a final fatal blow with gunshots. According to the testimony of government witness Joseph Valacci in 1963, it was revealed that Maranzano had paid Cole a substantial sum of $25,000 in advance for the three intended murders. However, when Cole arrived at Maranzano's office that very day, prepared to carry out the killings of Luciano, Genovese, and Costello, he was confronted with a surprising turn of events. He encountered Lucchese and the four Jewish hitmen hastily fleeing the scene, who informed Cole of Maranzano's demise. With his mission thwarted, Cole promptly departed the building. The next assassin is Gus Winkler, at the age of 16, Winkler enlisted in the United States Army Ambulance Corps and heroically served on the Western Front with the 91st Infantry Division. Following his return to the United States, Winkler became involved with the famed Egan's Rats gang, launching him into a life of crime. During this time, he met renowned figures such as Fred Killer Burke and Bob Carey for the first time. Winkler finally admitted to his wife Georgette that he had taken part in the infamous one-way ride murder of auto thief Wesley Smith in July 1923. After the core members of the Egan gang were incarcerated for a mail robbery in November 1924, Winkler and his associates found themselves joining forces with the Cuckoo Gang based in South City. However, their criminal exploits would soon come to a halt. On June 5, 1925, Winkler, along with Burke and Milford Jones, were apprehended in downtown St. Louis following a thrilling high-speed chase and shootout with the local police force. In a turn of events, Winkler relocated to Detroit within the next year and briefly aligned himself with the notorious Purple Gang, which was under the control of the influential figure A. Bernstein. The world of organized crime continued to shape Winkler's life as he ventured into new territories. A significant event involving the abduction of a Detroit gambler, Winkler and his companions found themselves in a precarious situation, having drawn the displeasure of Al Capone. In an effort to rectify the situation and secure their release, Winkler and his associates struck a deal with Capone and the Chicago outfit. This agreement involved offering their services on a freelance basis in exchange for the safe return of the kidnapped gambler. A unique bond formed between Capone and Winkler, leading to a close friendship. As a result, Capone enlisted Winkler and his group, consisting of Fred Burke, Bob Carey, Raymond Crane Neck Nugent, and Fred Getz, for special assignments. In a light-hearted manner, Capone referred to them as his American boys. While there is circumstantial evidence and Georgette Winkler's testimony suggesting their potential involvement, it remains uncertain whether Winkler and his crew took part in the murder of Brooklyn gangster Frankie Yale and the infamous St. Valentine's Day Massacre that shook Chicago in July 1928. Additionally, they were implicated in the killing of Toledo police officer George Zentera on April 16, 1928, which occurred as a consequence of an American Express armored truck heist. Despite Fred Burke being publicly named as a suspect in the massacre and the discovery of murder weapons, Winkler maintained the complete trust and confidence of Capone. Interestingly, Winkler often referred to himself as a contractor, a choice of words that carried an undertone related to his career as a contract killer. The aftermath of the St. Valentine's Day massacre had serious ramifications for the American boys, ultimately to their demise as an outfit clique. One of the members, Fred Burke, was later arrested and imprisoned for the first-degree murder of St. Joseph, Michigan police officer Charles Skelly. Bob Carey, on the other hand, was expelled from Chicago after attempting to extort a Capone accomplice. Crane Neck Nugent, another member of the group, mysteriously disappeared without a trace. As for Gus Winkler, he found himself in a severe car accident in Berrien County, Michigan on August 3, 1931, alongside St. Louis gangster John Babs Moran. The crash resulted in Winkler sustaining severe injuries, including the loss of one eye. While recovering in the hospital, Winkler faced accusations of planning and participating in a robbery of $2 million from a bank in Lincoln, Nebraska in September 1930. Although he was not directly involved in the robbery, Winkler claimed to know the perpetrators and promised to convince them to return the stolen money. Reluctantly, Capone provided Winkler with a cash bond of $100,000 upon his assurance. True to his word, Winkler successfully delivered on his promise. Within the following year, 
he established himself as the lucrative leader of the outfit's operations in the former territory of Bugs Moran's North Side Gang, after receiving a request for assistance from Teddy Newbery. Gus Winkler's downfall accelerated following Al Capone's imprisonment in 1931 due to tax evasion. With Frank Nitti assuming leadership of the outfit, Winkler found himself receiving orders from Italian-American gangsters who held reservations about his trustworthiness. Nitti and other traditional outfit mobsters had always opposed Capone's decision to grant positions of authority to non-Italian gangsters like Winkler. In December 1932, after Teddy Newbery arranged for Nitti to be shot and gravely wounded by Chicago Police Department Detective Harry Lang, another gangster named Ralph Pierce manipulated Newbery into confessing his own involvement through the influence of alcohol. In response, Nitti ordered the execution of Newbery. Further aggravating the situation, Winkler's insistence on deducting pensions for the families of his deceased crew members from the North Side Outfit's street taxes angered Nitti. As a result, Nitti demoted Winkler and appointed Ralph Pierce as the new head of the North Side Territory. The next assassin is Gregory Scarpa. A seasoned criminal, eventually rose to the position of captain within the Colombo crime family, and he also operated the Wimpy Boys Social Club. His criminal activities spanned a wide range, including illegal gambling, loan sharking, extortion, hijacking, counterfeiting credit cards, assault, stock and bond theft, drug trafficking, and murder. Many of the current high-ranking members of the Colombo family were once part of Scarpa's crew. In March 1962, Scarpa found himself arrested for armed robbery. In order to avoid prosecution, he made a deal to become an undercover informant for the FBI, marking the beginning of a 30-year relationship with the agency. During the Third Colombo War, Gregory Scarpa played a prominent role as the military commander for Carmen Persico. Despite his declining health, Scarpa patrolled Avenue U in Brooklyn, tirelessly seeking out supporters of Victor Arena in social clubs and bars. Fueled by his anger at the attempted murder of his family, Scarpa was particularly vigilant in tracking down William Cutolo, an Arena loyalist who had orchestrated the attack. During the ensuing weeks, Scarpa and his associates mistakenly targeted Thomas Amato, a member of the Genovese family as well as Rosario Nastasa, Vincent Fusaro, and James Malpaso, all staunch Arena supporters. It is rumored that Scarpa personally shot Fusaro while the latter was adorning his house with Christmas lights. Scarpa's actions during this time exemplified his ruthless dedication to the Colombo crime family's cause. Okay that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more character breakdowns and analysis of your favorite gangsters. See you in the next one.